Why don't disabled people matter? It's a question that's been ringing through my mind increasingly over the past few years as I've come to terms with my own disability, as I've watched the national conversation as it pertains to the coronavirus. Yeah, this is gonna be a video about the pandemic, but I promise you it's gonna be more than just that. Now this episode originally aired as a podcast, but frankly, it was so good that we wanna show it to as many people as possible. Now, I guess the best place to start is with this interview. And yeah. it's Dr. Rochelle Walensky. She's the director of the CDC. And she went on Good Morning America to discuss testing results and also just the outlook of how the pandemic will continue to affect us going forward. Given that, is it time to start rethinking how we're living with this virus, that it's potentially here to stay? You know, really important study, if I may just summarize it, a study of 1.2 million people who were vaccinated between December and October. The overwhelming number of deaths, over 75%, occurred in people who had at least four comorbidities. So really, these are people who were unwell to begin with. And yes, To paraphrase, people with four or more comorbidities were more likely to die from COVID. Now, a comorbidity is when someone has more than one health condition at the same time. So a list of someone's comorbidities could be depression, high blood pressure, cerebral palsy, spastic diplegia cerebral palsy, ankylosing spondylitis, cancer. I mean, the list goes on and on. Essentially, disabled people people who were unwell to begin with. And yes, really encouraging news in the context of Omicron. Today, we wanted to dive into that question just a little bit deeper. What's it like to be disabled in a global pandemic? What's it like to be disabled in America? So to answer those questions, we decided to interview some of our friends. And what we learned is frankly, so much bigger than just this pandemic. My name is Andrew Gerza. I'm a disability awareness consultant and host of the Disability After Dark podcast. So Andrew, what is your disability? I live with a cerebral palsy and I'm a full-time power wheelchair user. Power wheelchair user, both in that it's powered by electricity, but also like you put the power in power wheelchair it's, you user. Know, really, yeah, it's really cool. That's right. <laughs> I think the first time we met, you described yourself as super disabled, which immediately broke the ice and made, <laughs> made, me, made me laugh. That's correct. I did. Yeah, and it's, yeah. not an, it's not untrue. <laughs> My name is Imani Barbarin. I am a disability rights activist and advocate, and I use communications and social media to leverage the voices of the disability community to promote change. I have cerebral palsy. I have what's called spastic diplegic cerebral palsy, which basically just means that from the waist down, my muscles really tense really quickly. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Uh, it's it's a the amalgam of different uh, symptoms, so it's it's hard to pinpoint, but. That's the basics of it. <laughs> yeah, I think with any disability, it's like, here's a rough picture and don't yeah. worry about the specifics unless how much time do you have? Right, exactly. It's like, let me tell you how my day went and then we could just pick out the symptoms that manifested <laughs> just today. My name is Carice Hill. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am loosely a disability activist. I dabble in a lot of areas in chronic disease and disability Twitter. I live in poverty in California. I live with AS and I live with autism as well. And I am a gardener and a parent to two, no, sorry, four cats. Don't you forget those <laughs> other two, Carice. How dare gonna, you? My goodness. They're going to take me out. Yeah, if the camera gets knocked over and the Wi-Fi cuts out, <laughs> we'll know that the cats have, have gotten you. We did a lot of research for this when it was just a podcast. and Shout our, out to Zoe, who fact-checked this whole thing. And one of the research digging points was whether or not Carice had four cats. Yeah. Zoe went to Instagram and did, in fact, confirm that Carice does have four cats. So thank you, Zoe, for being so thorough. <laughs> So with our guests, and this is obviously a huge question, but the last two years have been super rough for everyone. <laughs> everyone, yeah, everyone, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but specifically, living as a disabled person during the pandemic, <sighs> what's that been like? I began sheltering in place before it was even declared a pandemic. And uh, funnily enough, I got really sick in early March of 2020. Everyone thought it was COVID. My friends and chosen family thought I was dying. We wrote my will. And so that was my start to the pandemic. And nothing has changed since then. I mean, I live in a, a care situation, so I have care providers and personal care attendants coming in and out of my home every day to provide me with the basic necessities that most people take for granted. So getting up, having a shower, just doing the day-to-day -day things people don't think about. Yeah. And when the when the pandemic hit, a lot of the staff started getting sick, which means that the people that require that care don't receive care. So over the last two years I've gone I've gone through 
weeks where they've said to us, we can't shower you because there might be an outbreak of COVID. So we can give you a bed bath, but you don't get to have a shower for possibly two weeks, maybe a month. They want to take every precaution. But what that does is it puts disabled people who need help to just have hygiene in a much more precarious position than I think people realize. Yeah, I, I guess. So thinking back to when the pandemic first started, we we all went into pseudo lockdown. I'm putting it in the biggest air quotes known to man because <laughs> we never quite did that. But w- what was that like? Because not having people come to you, that, that's not an option. That was never an option. Within the first year, we had 12 of our staff get COVID and it was constantly shuffling care and you didn't know if someone was going to show up or not. You didn't know if you were going to get out of bed that day. You were never sure. And there were been moments where like, I would have to call family members or friends and say, hey, can you come get me out of bed? Because I don't know if I'll be able to um, wow. today. And I have stuff to do. I, I'm a freelancer. I work for myself. And you know, I have stuff to do. So like, if I can't do that, how do I make money? How do I provide for myself? How do I just have a life or just even just get out of bed period and this by the way is not just in the beginning i mean this is continuing i saw what even just as recently as a week or two ago you were unable to have someone come give you a shower for for days that's right to not have that really plays a role in your mental health and really plays a role in your how you feel about yourself and how you feel about your body and your ability level and your productivity level all of that stuff goes down the drain because you know you might not get out of bed. Or if you go to bed one night, they might not get you up the next morning because no one's there. When I started seeing that not only were the staff getting it, but also realizing that because I have cerebral palsy, I was immediately aware that if I got it, it could be pretty dire for me, and that was scary. I I basically gave up sitting at my desk because I'm literally, like, it was a hard chair. I'm like, if I'm going to be home 24 hours a day for most days... I'm going to be more comfortable. It's been really rough on myself, my partner, who's also disabled, who had COVID at one point and was hospitalized. It's been terrifying. You know, every single day you're terrified to interact with people and to be in public and you're, you're terrified to go anywhere. And so your, your healthcare stops. And I had prided myself on even though not everything's going really well with this body, like I, I at least knew what was going on, right? Like I, yeah. I knew what my body was doing. I knew how it worked. I knew when I needed to check in with doctors and check in with my physicians and surgeons, but that stopped. Like I didn't, my first time being to the doctor was last month in two years. Wow. Um, and it, it's been devastating. Like I have a hernia, I've, I've developed GERD, like I'm just, like my body is just like, you needed to do something sooner. But again, going into the hospital was like, you know, terrifying. It was very clear from the very beginning that we were the ones that were going to die. So don't worry. And that, mm. that's how we started the pandemic was disabled people being told, Actually, they weren't even speaking to us. They weren't telling us anything. They were telling non-disabled people not to worry because, you know, we were disposable. You know, don't worry. Those people are going to die and not you. And so the fury. That's how we started. (laughs) That's how we started. And it hasn't stopped. It's even gotten worse. You know, it's it's gotten to the point where any time an immunocompromised pe- person or a disabled person who's not immunocompromised says, it's not safe for me, um, I've delayed surgeries, whatnot, the automatic response from so many people is, we'll just stay home. It's not my responsibility to care for you. And it, that's what we're up against is knowing that every time we open our mouths or sign with our hands or type with our keyboard, there are people out there who literally don't see us as human. They don't see us as deserving freedom. So when people are saying, oh, you know, like take off the mask because we want to be free. Whose freedoms are you talking about? It's not mine. As soon as COVID started, they said, okay, well, hospitals are overrun. There was a shortage of ventilators and they had some horrible situations where they had to decide, we're going to have to start making decisions about who's worth it, who isn't. 
And yeah. basically immediately the medical community said, well, if we have to make that call, disabled people are getting the axe. It's terrifying because what it shows is that it's always been there. If if your first thought is to say, and I have seen it on I've seen it on documentaries, I've seen nurses and doctors say it, I've seen them say things like, Oh, you know, well we would we would only hope that the elderly and the disabled get it and then it's okay. And, and, and you know, the director of the CDC said something very similar a few weeks ago. We all in the community were like, what did you just say? Why would you? Ah, okay. I know you've taken umbrage with the CDC through this. Uh, perhaps umbrage is a polite <laughs> word, but I like that word. Uh, seeing the CDC director talk about only disabled and elderly are getting sick. And that's a great thing. Uh, you would argue that's not good news. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't see, but my fists like started clenching as soon as you started talking about that. I really wish that um, medical professionals would see our lives as valuable. There's still stories like that of Michael Hickson. So Michael Hickson was a quadriplegic man. He was hospitalized for COVID-19. And as it was getting worse, Michael's wife asked his doctor what the next steps were to save his life. His doctor responded on a recording. As of right now, his quality of life, he doesn't have much of one. As of right now, his quality of life, he doesn't have much of one. Michael Hickson died at the age of 46 on June 11th, 2020. The entire medical institution really kind of devalues and gaslights disabled people on a daily basis. Sure. But then you throw into the mix the fact that we're technically not worth saving because we're seen as not valuable to society or to the economy or to productivity. And then on top of that, I'm a black woman. So... <laughs> Me going into the doctor's office is sketchy to begin with. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple. That's a perfect storm of doctors right. not giving a fuck. Right. I'm like, so, and I, I like, I told my boyfriend, like, if you, if I am so sick that I have to go to hospital, I don't know if I would want to go. Like, wow. just let me die here because I would rather be at home than be in the care of somebody who doesn't give a crap. Yes, everybody takes the oath of do no harm. Great. But what does that actually look like in a crisis? So what do you think about all of this? <laughs> the wish part. <laughs> well, you're immunocompromised. Right. Okay, so right, I'm immunocompromised. I'm disabled. That's, by the way, something that I wasn't even comfortable saying until recently. I, I told Andrew he's really the person that helped me recognize and come to terms with the fact that I, I, I am disabled. I kind of thought that I would do like a more bombastic disability coming out video, but this is it. Hey, I'm disabled. <laughs> but yeah, th these last two years, it's it's certainly been a mind fuck. I, uh, I talked to Chris about this, but I haven't been sure what to do. If I'm overreacting or underreacting, my job necessitates a certain level of risk. And sometimes, I'm okay with that risk, and other times I feel totally fucking insane. We had some scares here, and I wondered why I was doing this at all. And the answer was, well, okay, you know, this is our job. But I'm like, but but is it? Isn't at a certain point life and safety more important than like keeping a company running? And I think that's the whole country. We've we've put keeping the company running ahead of public's health and our own health again and again and again. And I guess as time has gone on, I've been beat down like the rest of us to just kind of accept, well, life is risky and you got to go and make that money. And um, it doesn't have to be this way. It just doesn't. Part of the fear here is not just the fear of death, but fear of long-term illness, of this affecting you for a very long time. Even if you're healthy, long COVID is a very real, incredibly disabling possibility. And for people like me already dealing with this shit, adding something else to the pile really isn't an option. But it's also a real threat that I think that, frankly, everyone is overlooking. So could COVID be a mass disabling event? Now, we talked with Dr. Raven Baxter. Raven, the science maven on YouTube. Uh, she was diagnosed with COVID in December of 2021. And as of February, when we talked to her, she was dealing with extremely debilitating long COVID symptoms. I should start by asking, how, how are you feeling today? 
That's a loaded question. <laughs> well, you caught me on probably the best day that I've had so far. I saw I you say that you, you're walking today. I'm walking. I am a science communicator. I have a doctorate in science education and my um, other degrees are in molecular biology. So I combine those two fields to make science fun and interesting to the public. So Raven tested positive for COVID on a Sunday, and for the next three days, she had intense flu-like symptoms. But after that, it seemed like your run-of-the-mill flu. She started to turn a corner. Day four, the flu-like symptoms had disappeared. I felt okay. I was like, I beat it. You know what I mean? I beat COVID. But then the shortness of breath kicked in on day five. Long COVID, or post-COVID-19 conditions, I'm going to read this so I can get it right, uh, refers to COVID-19 symptoms that persist beyond the initial phase of a COVID-19 infection. And while this is still so new and being studied and defined by various organizations, we do know that the WHO has defined common symptoms as fatigue, shortness of breath, cognitive dysfunction, and a whole laundry list of others. There is documentation of depression and anxiety being linked to um, COVID and um, documented as a post-COVID condition. In fact, yeah. when I went to my doctor and I followed up with them, when they did my write-up of our appointment, there's a code, like they have codes in the system of post-COVID conditions. And on my paperwork, it says post-COVID condition, colon, anxiety, post-COVID condition, colon, depression. They talk about these conditions in the context of COVID. This virus has also been known to reactivate other viruses. This information is coming out now, reactivating dormant viruses that are in our bodies. So studies estimate that out of the 80 million people infected with the coronavirus in the U.S. alone, about 27 million of them will develop long-term symptoms. 27 million. 27 million people. That's like, when you hear that, it just makes everything that we're doing feel so absurd. It's really sobering and, and terrifying and... I, I frankly don't know why that hasn't been more at the center of a lot of our conversations. Our viewers probably are, are asking a lot of questions uh, all at once. Uh, <laughs> so things that I know I would be asking, they would say, well, Dr. Raven, uh, how old are you? Are you healthy? Otherwise, like, was there something that made you more prone to this? I think the answer is young, yes and no. <laughs> you're, you're right. I mean, I... I'm uh, 28, no pre-existing conditions. I've never been hospitalized for any illnesses. I don't have any chronic illnesses. And I was relatively fit, you know, and I had good eating habits. Don't smoke or drink, you know. Um, I'm just, I'm just chilling, really. And COVID really deeply impacted my life, I would say. Yeah. I've, I've, I consider myself to have been sick for the past 45 days. I've never been this ill in my life, and I never would have imagined that COVID would do anything like this to me, but it has. You can be fine. You can be otherwise healthy, and this can flip the table of your life upside down. No matter who you are, whether you're vaccinated or not, whether you're healthy or not, whether you're young or not, you can still get long COVID. That can disable you. That can change your life. And the people who have experienced it will tell you it's changing your life for the worst. There was a one point where I couldn't see a way out of this. I'm like, I'm going to have to get a wheelchair. I saw that. Yeah, you were looking for for uh, recommendations on, on Twitter to, to get a motorized right. wheelchair. Because I it, the fatigue was lasting so long, it wasn't improving. And I said, well, I got to get out of bed. I got to, you know, but I can't walk. What am I going to do? I have doctor's appointments. I can't move. Well, and what that unfortunately exposes is we already in this country and in the world have horrible infrastructure for sick leave, for disability rights and disability benefits. The Center for American Progress did a report that 1.2 million more people are disabled than before the pandemic, uh, were disabled wow. because of the pandemic. That's a lot of people. Um, That's a lot of people. The study Imani's referencing here happened between 2008 to 2019. 109,725 individuals died prior to receiving a final decision on their disability benefit appeal. Long COVID is going to create a lot more disabled people than I think we're ready for. And I don't think 
I mean, I, I say welcome, join the club. Hi, we've always been there. But <laughs> for the rest of the, of the world, I don't think we're ready for that conversation. And that's going to be a huge wake-up call for a lot of people. In terms of worsening disabilities, I've heard everything from autoimmune diseases to POTS to, um, I'm hearing now of dementia, um, people developing early onset dementia. Um, even the brain fog of simply just being in this much stress for this long, people are having cognitive difficulties, difficulties focusing. There's a huge swath of the population all over the world that's saying, well, if we get COVID, it is what it is. Well, no, we don't know because we can say that now, but in a year and a half when you all of a sudden lose the ability to speak or walk or can't remember something you knew yesterday because of COVID, what are you going to do then? People who have long COVID are now disabled, welcome. And for their sake, it sounds terrible. I hope that it is not permanent, but uh, we have a whole new... A batch of people, over a million people, joining the disability community. America, the world, but let's talk about America, already does not know how to handle disabled people. So what happens to our systems when we add a million more on top of something that already doesn't work? I mean, we're seeing long waits for Social Security income. We're seeing people being forced out of their homes into poverty. Um, and when you say the world, you would actually incidentally be correct. 100,000 people died while waiting to to have a social security hearing. And that was the system when it was good. There's really not an emphasis on disability care across the world. Anywhere, um, sure. Yeah, like, and people always ask me like, which country is best? I'm like, the, the bar's on the floor. Like, <laughs> the book, like, I'm like, what do you want from me? Like, <laughs> You are in Canada, so we got a different thing going on, but what kind of social security like is there for uh, disabled people? I mean, in the province where I am, so I'm in Ontario, Toronto, um, you get about a thousand bucks a month, but that is before your rent, and that's before bills, and that's before you pay anything. By the time you're done paying everything, you probably are living on about 500, 600 a month, period. If, and if you're not doing a side hustle or being a freelancer, or I'm constantly working just so that I can, not, not even so I can do cool, luxurious things, but so I can just have enough money in the bank to do the, the, to do my essentials. Groceries, keep the lights on, and, you know, maybe have a pizza every now and then. If you're disabled and you need social assistance, you are supposed to be poor. I've ne you're never making enough, and you're constantly bumping up against wow. the poverty line. Yeah, to be disabled is to be assumed that you will and should live in poverty, um, or right on that line, and it's... Uh it's pretty fucked up. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really, really fucked up. If you want to apply for SSI, you need to have less than $2,000 per month. That is a, a staggering fact that people do not know. So I want you to slow yeah. it down and break it down for people. For Social Security income, if you are disabled, you <laughs> need less than $2,000. Total. They'll check your account every month. It, it is just the most, like, every time I hear that stat, every time I tell people that stat, not stat, that, that, that law, that fact. Yeah. It is, to be disabled in this country, it is, you are forced into perpetual welfare, right? I mean, or right. on the verge of it. Yeah, and you either have to be independently wealthy or extremely living well below the poverty line in order to survive. So there are going to be people spending down their money, divorcing, uh, losing their savings. And people are getting divorced specifically so they can qualify below that line. Yeah, getting divorced so that their partner could have all the assets in their name and then the person with the disability so could, you know, <laughs> have zero dollars to their name, which is terrifying because when you think about it, that also makes the disability community rife for abuse, financial mm -hmm. abuse, spousal abuse, because if somebody has your assets in their name, you have nowhere to go. I'm doing the Imani thing now where I'm hearing the most horrible thing possible and all I can do is laugh because it's, right, like it's, so, it's, it's just so deeply fucked up. It is like there's nothing more inhuman than that. An accessible vehicle is at the lowest point $50,000. A service animal is thirty to $50,000 and you're not allowed to save that money. Yeah, so this is all... Uh, fucked? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, and the pandemic, I think, has unearthed a lot of ways and exacerbated ways in which 
Society completely disregards disabled people. And it's also like with the pandemic slightly improving, it begs the question of how do we even return to normal? Right, and is there a normal to return to? It seems like the country is barreling ahead to a carefree summer. That that seems to be the tea leaves that I'm reading, right? You know, COVID yeah. or Coachella just announced that they're going to have no COVID restrictions, no masks, no vaccine. Go have fun. It seems like, once again, disabled people are going to be left to fend for themselves. I see disabled people, again, begging people to wear masks, even if it's just their choice. Um, and people, again, not caring. <laughs> and it, I feel like another variant's going to pop up in fall or winter because people have been congregating without masks and without the proper protections. As soon as things feel safe for a certain subset of the population, mitigation efforts are pulled back. I was just beginning to think, now I'm boosted, the weather's getting warmer, maybe I can go on like a picnic with a friend. And that's the extent of the safety, but then the mask mandates were pulled off and it's like, okay, now I just go and cease to exist again. And that's, it feels like that's what they want us to do. If they were in our homes every day and if they saw, cause we've, you and I talked about it, if they saw, your chronic pain journey or they saw my disability journey and they saw it every day, maybe they would think differently about it because it doesn't touch them as readily as it does you and I right now. They don't, it's not something they think about. So as much as I want to admonish those individuals and be like, what are you even doing? Part of me is also like, well, I have to keep educating because if I get mad at you and get angry, well, that's valid. I also, I also know that that's to get mad is energy and energy if you deplete all that, then you get sick faster. So I try to just do what I do and hope that people listen and tell my story on Twitter and Instagram and hope that it goes somewhere. Well, I mean, the thing is with the disability community, people really only care when they're in proximity to us and can be heralded for accepting our difference or helping us with our difference, right? This whole idea of inspiration narratives and inspiration or exploitation, it relies on proximity to disabled people, to interact with disabled people. And yet we've been so isolated, we're not even thought about, right? Sure. We're not even being discussed amongst certain groups of people. They're putting themselves at risk too. Like, that's what I don't get. I get Americans not caring about other people. We're selfish people. But to not care about yourself, like knowing what you know. There is a chance that you will become disabled and we're over here, we're telling you. Yeah. No one takes care of disabled people. So yeah. be selfish and you will save yourself strife in the future and also be selfish. Make the world better for disabled people and the disabled community because guess what? If you live a really long time, you also are going to join us. No matter what, you're coming. You're getting here eventually. I think what people think when they think of disability is like a very isolated group of people and segregated group of people, which is true, but your likelihood of becoming disabled increases as you age um, and it has increased greatly with this pandemic. So you are who you were before your disability. You're just now disabled. But I think the community is really open to making sure that there's space for the newly disabled and for people who are dealing with ident an identity crisis of becoming disabled because when we tie almost all of our identity to productivity in the economy, it could feel devastating to realize nobody sees you in that light anymore. Like you don't have value within that framework. Uh, you'll be happy to know, or I don't know if you'll be happy to know. Um, you should know that since our first talk, you, you would ask me if I considered myself disabled and it was something that I wasn't sure that I could or if I should. And I, I, I do. And I, I thank you for helping me on that. Oh well, journey. yeah, I'm so I'm so glad to hear that because I mean it's not an easy it's not an easy word to say. Yeah, it comes with so much baggage and people put so much on you when you start talking about that. It's othered and we don't think about it and we think of disability as this this very small niche that only touches a few unlucky few, um, but this touches a lot of people's lives. Yeah, the disability community is one of the most restorative and kind and generous group of people that you will ever come across. At least the little portion that I that I kind of situate myself within. I have found a corner of Twitter that I call Queer Crip Twitter. So queer people, disabled people, 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's my fam. I've found my family during the pandemic. And, you know, so I have my trans siblings who are also disabled, who have the same disabilities as me, who are also autistic. And just having that safe space where I'm not going to be questioned. We all know that we're terrified. That's, you know, just having a safe space where people care about me. People are fighting for the same stuff that I'm fighting for. You know, for disabled people, the fatigue is real. And we're not tired of the virus. We're tired of ableism. And finding, you know, finding our community, centering ourselves around our community has been really awesome. Yeah, I think what I want people to walk away with is you need to prioritize the voices of the people who are going to be most affected by your actions. Um, and even if you think what you're doing is benign or doesn't matter, it matters to people that you may not see or interact with on a daily basis. Our lives have literally stopped as disabled people. It's not a matter of not being able to go to the grocery store. We don't do any of those things. We can't go out as often as we would like to. Um, so understand just how impactful you are on a daily basis in the actions that you're taking. There's a phrase in the disability community called nothing about us without us. And that can be applied across all aspects of life, all aspects of public decision making. I mean, what has to change whether we get more disabled people or not is they should be hiring disabled people at high, the highest levels of government to advise the president, to advise world leaders, to advise all those people on how do we do this, not only at, at governmental levels, but in hospitals, we need disabled doctors and nurses and liaisons to talk about how do we help help these individuals when they start needing wheelchairs, when they start needing attendant care, who's going to guide them through? Well, guess what? The best people to guide them through are the people that live it every day. I know how to do that, but I'm not going to do it for you for free. I should, we should be, we should be compensated for our knowledge and for our wisdom as disabled people. People don't realize that the lived experience of being disabled comes with a lot of gifts to share with the world. But if I give it away for free, then how am I going to eat? Hold your policymakers accountable and make them accountable for your life. This is your life. This is life and death. This is, this is your daily life for the next iteration for the next chapter um, and I would also want people to walk away with we're not getting normal back get that out of your mind we're not getting normal back but we can do better we can do better by one another it is not just let's fall back into our old patterns let's make sure all these systems go back to the way they were even if they were broken we have the opportunity to do better because we can all see it now there's no one that can say that they don't see it so take that as an opportunity to change where you live, change the, the policies that affect your community, and change this country for the better, because we can. There also is something selfish that you can take away here from being selfless. If you center those who are most vulnerable in your considerations, it will make life better for everyone. And I fear what the future looks like if we continue on this path. And if nothing else, I hope that people can take away um, some fucking empathy and understanding that while the pandemic may be improving, it is far from over. And for many people, it will be far from over for a long, long time. Thank you for watching this. If you wouldn't mind sharing, it would really help get the word out. Uh, big ups to Miles, who produced this, Rainey, who also did an incredible job, and a special thanks to all of our guests, and uh, stay safe out there. <laughs>